I'm really happy and excited to introduce the next panel to uh, please uh, come up uh, and, uh, and talk about not just food security and how that's connected to, to water, so the water food nexus, but also the geopolitics in, the, in this region in particular. Uh, so if I can have you actually uh, come on up and, and we have uh, Ms. Zahra Babar from uh, Georgetown University, Qatar, will be moderating this panel for us. And Thank Zahra, I'll let you... I think you're there, there. yep. And then Logan's right next to you. It's volume, so. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Raha. Okay. Actually, I want to thank Raha as well as Jamie Olson and other colleagues at Georgetown University in Qatar for so generously inviting me to be part of this important conversation. I feel privileged and honored to be here. As Raha said, my name is Zahra. I work at Georgetown University in Qatar um, at the Center for International and Regional Studies there. And if I was to spend or to do due justice to introducing these four gentlemen, we'd probably be here until tea time, so I'm going to make it quite short. I think you've already had the opportunity to meet Professor um, Giordano. Mark Giordano is a colleague of mine, but at the Washington uh, campus of Georgetown University. He's a professor of geography and vice dean for undergraduate um, affairs at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. His research focuses on international political dimensions of water, agriculture, and the environment. Next to Mark is my friend and colleague from within our campus. This is Professor Logan Cochrane, who is at Hamad, uh, Khalifa, you know, Hamad bin Khalifa University. He is an associate professor there at the College of Public Policy. His research is extremely diverse, both uh, from a disciplinary as well as geographic perspective, but he works on uh, themes of food security, climate change, social justice, and governance. Next to Logan, Mr. Ali Abu Saba is part of the Consortium of International Agricultural Research Centers. It's a long mouthful. I hope I got that correct. He is their regional director for Central and West Asia and North Africa. He is also the director general of the International Center for Agricultural Research in Dry Areas, as we all know, ICADA. And next to Ali, we have Dr. Mohammed Hussein Imadi, who is joining us from Iran. He is Iran's former ambassador and permanent representative to several UN agencies based in Rome, including the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Program, and IFAD. He has more than 40 years experience in agricultural food systems, rural development. So as Raha mentioned when she uh, invited us to the podium, the topic of uh, food and water and the nexus has been already raised several times, including in this first panel that I attended this morning. But we're hoping in our conversation today to delve a bit more deeply into the geopolitics around food security and also specifically focusing on the Gulf. About 12 years ago uh, at the center where I work at Georgetown, we, we were talking about discussing the idea of doing a project looking at food security in the Middle East. And having spent about 15 years working in poverty alleviation and rural development in South Asia, obviously I started focusing a lot of attention for that project, looking at the parts of the Middle East where we know, which we traditionally assume are deeply food insecure. Um, and the Gulf states, the six monarchies, were not really within my vocabulary. And I remember these discussions when I was saying, but you know, how can the GCC states possibly be food insecure? These are largely wealthy, resource-rich countries in terms of financial wherewithal. Surely we can't consider their populations to be food insecure. The world's hungry, uh, numerically, lie in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Isn't that what we're talking about? We're talking about addressing food security. So I think what I'd love to start this discussion off and this is not because I'm biased towards Mark, who is a geographer, but because I'm always interested in complex terminologies and complex geographies. We take it for granted that all of us know what we're talking about. We're talking from food, about food insecurity or food security as though we're from one place in the world and everything's to be addressed uh, in that way. But um, the world is complex when it comes to geography. So I'd like all of you from your own perspectives to think a little about to, you know, this, this point. What is food security? What is food insecurity? Are we all on the same page? 
And what are the ways in which we can think about the, addressing this when we know how complicated the geography of our world is? Can I ask you, Mark? So I'd just say one of the problems that's been mentioned a number of times is the lack of awareness of where our water comes from. Mm -hmm. And include, there a couple of discussions yesterday mentioned that even people here in Doha don't realize that the water coming out of their tap comes from the, the D cell. But I, I th think generally the, the lack of understanding is much deeper because while that is in this place, that's where the drinking water comes from, that's maybe 10% maybe of total water consumption because the majority is coming from what was used to produce the agriculture that's feeding all of us while we're, we're here. And globally, of global calories, 60 something percent are wheat, rice, corn, and soybeans. And if you look at where those are produced, it's maybe eight regions of the world, pretty small regions that might cover 5% of global area, produce more than half of all of, of all of those. And then once those are produced, when they go into the, the trade system, they go through maybe five sets of ports and rail systems, part in the US, in uh, part of South America, uh, coming through the Black Sea, Indoganj the ports in, in India, ports in Southeast Asia. And then from there it passes through just a few choke points, uh, the Bosphorus, the Panama Canal, Malacca Strait. You know, so you have this, this you, that, all the food that's coming to us here in this spot starts in from pretty narrow areas to finally, to finally get here, which means that if you're talking about the water, global water system, if it doesn't rain in Australia, that means the wheat that is imported here may not come here or may be at a higher price or uh, moving from the natural to the political. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, if there's a drought in India, the, Indi the first thing the Indian government is gonna do is restrict the rice ex exports that come here. Or when there's a war in Ukraine, suddenly there's no grain flowing through the, 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 Bos the Bosphorus. So just to say, they, the, the water, there's the direct consumption of water, there's the indirect consumption of water through, the, through agriculture. This particular spot mm -hmm. is perhaps the most dependent on the global agricultural system to keep, uh, to keep feeding itself. So water, food, geopolitics are completely intertwined. Interlinked. Absolutely. I think we saw that directly in Qatar several occasions, including yeah post geopolitics, but even before that, you know, some uh, grain bans. And I think that's one of the things that made it an imperative for the country to start thinking along the lines of very strategic approaches towards addressing their, their food supply. <clears throat> Logan, sure. like to pitch in? Let me start large and zoom in. And by starting large, I can say over a couple of decades, we saw progress on food insecurity improving around the world. That continued, let's say, from the 90s until around 2014, 2015. And then the, both the percentage of undernourished people and the aggregate number of people who are hungry around the world started to increase. And this was primarily due to conflict. And we saw then, at that time, South Sudan and then Yemen and so forth. So what I want to then narrow in on in our region and building on uh, what we just heard is the geopolitics component of this session. We've got food security, and then so what are these geopolitical, and to connect it with all of us, when we go home this evening, we turn on the TV, we will see Gaza, undoubtedly. And they, of course, have had a blockade since 2007. And I want to move backwards slightly, the Ukraine war, which you mentioned, uh, the region was heavily reliant on food from either Ukraine or Russia. And just to give you uh, one example of this, uh, if we look at Egypt, 100% of its barley imports were from Ukraine and Russia. 100% of its sunflower, the oil and the seed, were from Ukraine and Russia. 100% of its, or, sorry, 86% of its wheat were from Ukraine and Russia. And when you have a conflict in this region and you are unable to export from the ports, that significantly affects this region. I just picked Egypt, but uh, recently Dr. Sultan Barakat and I looked across the whole region to see a dependency and risks, uh, geopolitical risks. Uh, out of that. We go back slightly before that, we all experienced global supply chain disruptions due to a public health measure. Go back uh, slightly uh, before that here, if you're living in the state of Qatar at that time, there was a blockade of the state. 90% of the food 
previous to that blockade was imported from our regional neighbors who imposed a land, sea, and air blockade. That was a significant food security shock to the system. And maybe in follow-up questions, I can explain a little bit about what the state of Qatar has done in responding to those challenges. But just to emphasize the importance of geopolitical in this conversation of food security, we just keep going back and we have more and more disruptions. Outside of the conflict space, we had disruptions related in West Africa to Ebola, in South and Central America due to Zika. And you keep running back that geopolitics related to public health, related to conflict, related to economics, related to boycotts and bans and restrictions of food exports. Food uh, was restricted after the financial crisis, for example, in the triple crisis of finance, food, and fuel after the 2007, 2007 and 2008 financial crisis in the US. So this is something we've been regularly experiencing almost every year, every two years. And I mention all these examples just to highlight the critical importance of the geopolitical uh, in this conversation of food security. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Logan. Um, that's, that, that I think builds on some of the work that Ali, you have previously done because you have, you would, earlier we were speaking about the fact how you have done a lot of work in areas where conflict has been one of the biggest impediments to taking the sort of important research work that organizations <clears throat> like Gada engaged in and actually implementing those towards uh, important food security goals becomes problematic when you're dealing with these sorts of geopolitics. Could you build on that a bit? Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, it's important here that, uh, you know, uh, in Qatar, uh, part of the GCC uh, is part of the larger Siwana region where, uh, you know, the drylands, uh, an important part of the drylands are, uh, and where water is the most limiting factor. Uh, Logan had, uh, and uh, the uh, predecessors uh, spoke about you know, some of the challenges. And I want to bring specifically the 2008 uh, food crisis, yeah. uh, price rise, and more recently the uh, COVID and the global disruption of the food supply chains, I think has driven many of uh, the countries in the region and across the world to rethink the whole concept of food security. Now, we need to understand that food security, as much as it's a lot of economics, a lot of strategic planning, it's also a, a very important sovereign issue. So every country will decide for themselves how to interpret these concepts and then develop their national plans and strategies to cope with this in the way that suits them the best. And the complexity that we have here is the water scarcity and uh, you know, the added complexity of the geopolitics in the region. So uh, it's very important in the planning process uh, to understand the opportunities and the challenges. The opportunities in the drylands more broadly is that it's capable of producing almost half of the food that we uh, produce on the planet. So in terms of potential, it's huge. But the question is how you deal with some of the limiting factors, not just only water, but the geopolitics, as mentioned by my colleagues. And I think, uh, you know, the GCC also, as a group of countries, have enormous opportunities for collaboration around the issues of uh, agricultural research, water research, splitting and sharing the agenda and learning from each other. And I think some of the work we've done here in the GCC is to really define in a very collaborative way what the challenges are for the region and trying to bring the countries together, to think together, to develop together, to test and adapt together, and then from there draw in the policy uh, evidence, the science evidence to be able to make uh, uh, policy decisions. I can elaborate a little bit more probably later on about some of the technologi technological uh, you know, opportunities that have been developed in the region and in how it is helping countries to produce the minimum amount of food they need to produce in case they have to. Because the issue is about being able to know how to produce food, not necessarily to produce it all the time, because like others mentioned, it may not necessarily be the most economic option to resort to. We can discuss that a little bit later. Thank Perfect, you. thank you so much. Um, Dr. Mahdi, your, I think it's, it's extremely valuable to have your input on this panel, because we're talking about the Gulf, and what frequently happens is a lot of the discussion gets focused on the six monarchies and their conditions, the six Arab monarchies' conditions for food security and the ways they're addressing it are different from how Iran had, has both the capacity to address it as well as 
a difference in natural resources. I'd like you to provide that perspective, but I think building on what Ali just said, and given your previous experience with the Food and Agricultural Organization, with IFAD, what are some of the transnational ways in which these organizations are helping to bridge the gaps in how we address food security in the Gulf? Uh, actually, as my colleagues mentioned, the food security in the region is really very, very sensitive and in the meantime very fragile. Uh, although there is a different country with a different strategy, as you mentioned, from Iran of the GCC countries, but in the meantime, we are facing with the three capital C which make the situation much worse. One is climate change, which actually our region is one of the most fragile areas of the world, which makes the food security much more important for all countries. Mm -hmm. And second C, of course, is conflict, which we are in the center of conflict. As you can see, the impact of uh, sort of war with uh, mm -hmm. Ukraine and also Gaza, and the blockade and the sanction, the most uh, actually uh, impressed countries in the world are in the same region. And the third C is the COVID, which uh, we call it pandemic in general, and it's repeatable based on the immunologist prediction. Therefore, the region are in the center of the sort of boiling point in terms of three capital C that I mentioned. And in the meantime, we have a different strategy among different countries. Some of them buy the food security with their purchase power, based on the money that they got from the fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And of course, not only food security, but also water security by uh, the very cheap energy that they can use desalination. And in the meantime, we have countries which are a little bit different. Uh, of course, Iran is one of them. During the last 40 years, Iran changed their strategy based on the revolution. And also in the meantime, they invested in agriculture highly and uh, try to be independent in terms of economy based on oil. And from 4 million barrels 40 years ago now, we are in about 1 million with a twice or three times population. Therefore, we are facing with the challenges in the other side, which is uh, pressure on the resources, particularly water, in such a way that we come up to the degree of bankruptcy, water bankruptcy. Therefore, I think the different strategies in the region come up with uh, huge problems, both sides. The one that buy the, the food security and the one that put a lot of pressure on the resources, particularly the water and the land and the soil. Uh, in this matter, I think, uh, based on the three C that I mentioned and all facts that we can see during the last 40 years, it's a time to rethink and change the strategy in such a way that uh, look at the food security in different definitions. And in the meantime, United Nations, particularly FAO and HLPE, which is a high panel of experts, which are thinking about the definition of food security, they also are thinking differently from the meaning and the concept of food security. The food security is not the same meaning that we had in 40 years, 10 years, and even five years ago. And now there are lots of indicators that are adding. For example, as we all know, food security is uh, food for all, in all times, in a stable situation for access to the healthy, nutritious food. But at the moment, the HLP, just about three weeks ago, issued a sort of paper which says that there are lots of other indicators for food security, which with these food security indicators, I think we need to rethink about food security in the region either the people or the countries which buy the food security or the countries like Iran which put the pressure on resources and uh, abuse the sort of natural resources in such a way that I will discuss it and elaborate it later on in the next session. Excellent. No, thank you so much. I think that comes very much back to the first point we had um, where Professor Giordano was saying similar things, that this is not a... It, it can appear as almost a zero-sum situation where enhancing food security for one country might end up damaging the, some form of the, either environmental resources or in other cases actually damaging food security in another part of the world. I also want to pick up the point of food sovereignty because I think that again is a really important concept which is understood differently in different contexts. In the GCC states, of course, it was very much around um, the right 
to control your food sources, which led to the emergence of plants to grow food um, indige indigenously, which of course creates all kinds of problems for water resources. And you were talking about this earlier, Mark. Can we, so, so is it a zero sum thing and how do we go about making sure it's not? I'm gonna shift away from your question slightly <laughs> okay. and maybe come back to it. But I wanna, Ali reminded me of, a, of an important point that it is connected to why it doesn't need to be a zero sum game, but why there's also an issue of, there's a geopolitics that maybe most of us haven't thought of before. If you're trying to grow, have agriculture that responds well to changing climatic conditions, in particular in this area with increased drought, increased variability, you have to have seeds that have the genetic material that you can draw from. Icarda has, I think, the best collection of these seeds in the world. And where is the seed bank, or where was the seed bank? In Syria. And so suddenly when the conflict starts in Syria, this seed bank that has all the genetic material that you need for the best adaptation to a changing climate is endangered and has to be you know, people risk their lives to get the seeds out of the country and put them some, somewhere else. Okay. So just that, that you know, there's the, the immediate geopolitics of the food delivery, there's the longer term geopolitics of who owns genetic material, how do you keep it safe, how do you diversify it, uh, so that you can continue growing food with the changing water environment so that you can reduce the zero sum aspect Perfect. of many of these, the, the, related to the question that you just mentioned. Great. Logan, you had mentioned earlier, I mean, building on what Mark just said, more solution oriented, both scientific, technological, and other, other solutions which may also be political and social. Yeah. You were talk, going to talk to us a bit about what Qatar has done. You had some ideas on that. Sure. I will leave the technological innovations for my colleagues, but I'll, maybe I'll share what the state of Qatar uh, has done. And before I do that, I know Dr. Masood Al-Marri, director of the Food Security Department, is not able to be here with us, but to acknowledge his leadership over the last years on this, and I'm just sharing you know, what they've been doing. Um, so as mentioned, the blockade, uh, land, sea, and air, 90% uh, of the food being imported before 2017, uh, primarily from the countries that imposed the land, sea, and air blockade on the state, presented a serious food security shock. Uh, what to do in such a scenario, and then how to develop a more resilient food security system for the long term. And uh, as we all enjoyed our break and our fresh berries and, and pineapples and so on, we overcame this as a, as a country. So what are some of the, the key initiatives? And if you're interested, you know, there's a food security strategy for the state that's available but I'll just highlight a few of these. One of them was expanding and being much more evidence-based on having a national strategic food reserve so that if there was a shock, whether it was conflict-related, geopolitically-related, pest, disease, global health, and we can go down the list of potential risks to food supply, that the state would, at least at essential and emergency levels, would be able to provide needs for the people for at least a six-month period. And this was a, an, an immediate response, but it required a lot of work. You need to have the facilities, you need to have the evidence to pick the commodities, the sufficiency of the quantities, the monitoring mechanisms so that the commodities don't sit and expire and you're rotating. So this, is, this sounds like a simple initiative, but it's, a, it's quite a large initiative. This is one of the four pillars of the, of the food security strategy. A second pillar was increasing domestic production. And we've you know, heard about some of these challenges of increasing domestic production. And there have been some successes. The state recognized in the beginning this isn't a, an agriculturally rich place in terms of its soils and water resources. So this needed also to be strategic. And uh, we now have 100% of our dairy products produced domestically and significant improvements in a number of vegetables, fish products, some meat products, et cetera. These are not random. They were part of the strategy. A number of these targets have been met or surpassed. And uh, previous to 2017, production in most of these domains were minimal. So a really rapid transformation in the agricultural production sector. Then that's the second pillar. The third pillar is around markets. You want to have an efficient marketplace that distributes the materials that you produce, as well as those that you're importing, uh, to avoid food loss and avoid food waste. And uh, this required a lot of market reformation, 
storage facilities, you see new markets being emerged, fish markets emerging, and so on. Um, so this was pillar number three, focusing on, on domestic, domestic markets. Pillar four is diversification of imports. Over the long term, the state of Qatar will continue to be a net food importer of food. Uh, we will not be food self-sufficient as our own production sources. So how do we mitigate the risks that we previously experienced where a large share came from one country? And if that one country decides to use that as leverage, that becomes a risk. So how do we diversify that risk? And this was through import diversification measures. There were a number that were set in the strategy. And this has been the most difficult to achieve. Uh, you can imagine if one is importing frozen chicken, as the state of Qatar does from Brazil, and it is the cheapest on the marketplace, uh, then it's difficult to diversify unless you're going to hand down those costs somewhere to the government or to the consumers. And so this has been sticky, particularly when the government isn't procuring these items, it's the private sector. Uh, other examples could say that we shifted reliance from one country to another. If you look at now imports of a number of fruits and vegetables to the state of Qatar, large shares come from Iran, our, our neighbors, which uh, was important. We needed to overcome that, but we've moved from dependency to dependency and we have faced some challenges on achieving food diversification from the import side. Those are four pillars of the food security strategy, some of the lessons on you know, how do we move towards a more resilient uh, food security system for the state of Qatar. Mm -hmm. But I'll add a fifth pillar, which is invisible in the strategy, but is an enabler for all of these things to take place. And over the last 20, 20 years, the state of Qatar has invested in enabling infrastructure. So this includes ports, this includes aviation and logistics infrastructure, highways, roads, it includes developing the free zones in the last you know, four years. And if you've visited, you can see a rapid development in the free zones in this very short period of time. Um, and working with the investment, Qatar Investment Authority, one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, as well as Hassad Foods, which makes similar food uh, investments domestically and abroad. And all of these are enablers for the strategy to be successful. Thank you so much, Logan. Very thorough and thoughtful summary of, of Qatar's the approach they've adopted to addressing their food insecurity. Just one quick question, follow up. Several years, well, about a decade ago, when um, when not just Qatar but other Gulf states were also receiving quite a lot of media scrutiny for these supposed investments that they were making overseas, and a lot of the concern was that they were purchasing land in other parts of the world, and that this was would produce all kinds of vulnerabilities for communities there. Do you have anything on that? There has significant uh, investment on. Uh, if we want to call it large-scale land investment or large-scale land acquisitions or the land grab or you know pick a name, the uh, foreign direct investment in the agricultural sector, it goes by lots of names. If you want to research it, I have a recent book on this topic. <laughs> if you get bored, um, so there's a you know a lot to say. In terms of Qatar's investment internationally, it hasn't been significant in terms of the farm-to-plate supply chain. So if you're sort of the farm-to-plate. Supply chain would mean you purchase farmland in X country, let's say Sudan, where the state of Qatar does have investments, and you control the complete supply chain from the farm to uh, the plate. Uh, some countries have made more larger investments in terms of land size, in terms of geography, in terms of financial investments in this. And um, I would say the long story short on this is that it's been much harder than some of the investment authorities thought it would be. There are many geopolitical risks, and if you're a country that thought Sudan would be a wonderful place to invest, which used to be, you know, in the 70s, we talked about Sudan as the breadbasket of Africa. And, you know, it has this potential to be the breadbasket of Africa. Geopolitics makes it maybe a much more riskier place to make uh, an agricultural investment. So a lot of other factors have played into rethinking investment. And if you look at where Qatar Investment Authority does make its investments, as well as uh, Hassad Foods, it's increasingly less on land and in other forms of uh, the food system. Okay, thank you.
Um, Ali, I wonder if we can go back and dig further into the sort of innovation and technology side of things, particularly <clears throat> because of um, the sort of work the organization organizations you represent do. And we have already, I'm delighted to say, some questions from the audience, so please keep them coming. The barcode's on your table. But the question asks specifically on what role can technology and, um, and innovation play, particularly when it comes to addressing uh, food security issues in arid zone uh, countries like the Gulf, which have these challenges, climatic, also lack of arable land and water resources. What are the advancements that are being made that can be deployed not just here, but in similar countries? Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for the question because uh, I think I, I also would like to uh, emphasize that the innovations are not only uh, physical innovations. Uh, I think uh, just maybe a couple of comments on my predecessor and before I come into this point, the whole question of diversification is key. And that uh, the implementation of the diversification approach by itself is an innovation. Uh, uh, diversification in the way you design your cropping systems, the way you exploit your available natural resources, and the way you deploy opportunities from across the globe to your own local context. Um, if I jump a little bit uh, into the future, like 20 years from now, I think we are going to reach a stage where we have to eat what we can grow, rather than insisting on growing what we would like to eat. And that is going to be a major shift in thinking of humans. Uh, now, whether it happens 20 years, 50 years, or even after 10 years, you know, I cannot tell with any degree of precision, but I know for sure it's going to happen. So. Um, for example, in uh, you know, the, the state of Qatar, where I have to really emphasize they made exceptional uh, progress in uh, planning and implementing uh, specific measures to deal with the whole issue of food security. But I think the system is still vulnerable because with the self-sufficiency on dairy, the animal feed comes from Sudan. Uh, and for most of the GCC, it's a lot of fresh imports of Bersin, for example, right? So one of the things and innovations is that we are now developing cactus, something that grows well in this environment as a substitute to animal feed. You can actually <clears throat> use up to 30% of your mix using cactus. And probably in the future, we're going to work on making cactus a little bit more nutritious. So that becomes a substantially higher percentage in, in doing so. If I take another example from the region Egypt, uh, Egypt is one of the largest importers of wheat uh, in the world, which is, you know, a shame, I have to say. I'm, I'm from Egypt myself, by the way. Uh, and they produce half of it, they import 10 million. And you've emphasized it comes from Ukraine and, 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 and Russia. So when the conflict started, there is panic because there's a huge national security risk to have 110 million hungry people. And in yeah. Egypt, people eat bread three times a day, and the Minister of Supply will tell you he produces 750 million loaves of bread every single day. So uh, what we have done, we've gone back to the gene banks. We found that Egypt traditionally consumed large quantities of barley. So we started to look at what the gene bank can offer as close as it can possibly be to wheat. And we've done experiments to demonstrate the science evidence behind a policy decision to substitute up to 30% of a wheat barley flour mix that significantly enhances the food security of Egypt. So that's an innovation, because you would displace six tons out of your ton, 10 tons imports of wheat, and then significantly improve the sense of and the reality of uh, you know, food security. And I think in this region, uh, you know, the potential to look more at what traditionally has been growing, I think you have date palm, uh, you have many other traditional crops, even when it comes to the whole issue of feeding the animals, plenty of other choices of natural <laughs> habitat, natural plants that could be uh, developed further. The way, the reason why wheat is doing so well, because of 50 years of investments in research and development. So why don't we start to look at a much broader basket that God has created in the gene banks and look at every country context and how we can actually invest in making those species and natural uh, potentially uh, items that you can grow for both food and feed uh, for the animals. So these are just some examples about the work we do and how we can actually deploy science to deal with some of the challenges. My last point, just before I close, 
the rising temperatures and the climate change, which is really the whole thing of, you know, that is driving the conversation here. The dry lands is uh, likely going to lose up to 20% of the total production capacity uh, by the year 2050, simply because of the rise of four to five degrees uh, increased in temperature. And I'm really happy because for the past couple, of, for today and yesterday, we've had a lot of emphasis on the four and five degree scenarios where most of the other global events, people speak about the global average of 1.5, which for the lay person sometimes may not be providing the real accurate representation of what's going to happen in this region. So I really commend the speakers of having been speaking so directly to the issues. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, <coughs> excellent. But it's, it's got me on to a um, philosophical sort of <laughs> point of mind that, you know, about 15 years ago, I was shouting at everybody and saying, don't eat quinoa. And that is because I have, I'm a, I have a firm belief that you, know, that you mentioned the, the importance of growing particular grains that, I'm, that could do well in Egypt and could be consumed locally. But the problem is food is not just a right and it's not just produced for food security and to feed people who are hungry. It has become a commodity which is traded. And the next thing you know, perhaps Bali becomes super globally, you know, everyone wants it. So it's leaving Egypt and being eaten in Finland instead. So this to me is, is a problem, is that we're used to thinking, we have become uh, attuned to thinking of having food of whatever preferences available to us year round, wherever we are. And this is a problem, right? Um, anyway, we can move away from my philosophy <laughs> to move on to Dr. Imadi. We have a question here, which I think is really interesting, and I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on it. But perhaps we'll start with you, which is the question from an audience member is, why is it that people seldom associate water consumption with agriculture, that it's almost invisible? Um, we see water being wasted, quote, quote, or used in all other manner, and we want to control its usage, but somehow the food that's in our water is forgotten. And so what can be done to kind of raise awareness in this so that people are more aware of how much water goes into the production of their food and perhaps are a little more conscientious in how they approach their food and its wastage? Uh, actually, the issue is much more cultural and uh, related to the society. I think traditionally, Middle East and Near East and North Africa, we always have been in a dry and semi-dried area. And this is part of our culture. I can tell about the central part of Iran, which the water is a holy product. It's not just water, it's to all. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the value among the people is completely different. The attitudes of the people toward the water is different. You know, for example, we call uh, the name of village Abadi, means coming from Ab. Mm -hmm. The place that Ab is there is developed. And the Aban means the place that there is no any water. The Aban, the desert. You know, Ab and water is the, the significant uh, cultural, meaningful issue for the people for a long, long time. But unfortunately, during recent times and urbanization and modern life, the connection between people and the nature have been cut, particularly the new generation. And when this uh, sort of organic, um, philosophical, attitude and for relationship have been cut, the people look at the food as a product, as you mentioned, as a sort of uh, products that make just him uh, full of energy, nothing more than that. That's why this is a much more cultural thing than so on and so forth, and I think that needs to be uh, actually in the part of the education system, particularly for the new generation. But coming back to the uh, issue in uh, global level and uh, regional level, mm -hmm. I really do believe <coughs> that we need in our region, uh, regional food sovereignty strategy. Why? Because we have uh, diverse countries. From the monarchy that you mentioned, from the country which buy the uh, food security and the country which focus on the self-sufficiency and the mm -hmm. natural resources are different. And as Ali mentioned, we have a very valuable, diverse genotype and uh, type of area in the Near East and in the GCC country. And when you have a variety, when you have diversity, this is a source, this is the wealth for cooperation. That's why I'm thinking with this diversity, the regional sort of cooperation among the countries, although it seems to be politically very far, 
But I think the pressure, the old sort of tragedy, make a uh, sort of uh, type of change for the people to think about the new way of thinking. That's why I'm thinking with such a diverse situation that we have in the region, there is a seed and the capital for cooperation. And this cooperation can work in two manner. One, of course, is a cooperation among the countries. And the second, of course, is innovation. And cooperation in innovation and innovation in cooperation. That's very important. We need to actually think about, and when I talk about innovation, innovation, of course, is means not only technology, just hard part of hard uh, type of uh, technology, but also software in terms of way of thinking, in terms of conceptualization, mm -hmm. in terms of way of looking non-linear uh, and uh, uh, multiple and uh, transdisciplinary way of thinking about the uh, cooperation among the member countries in the region. And in terms of innovation, of course, uh, as uh, my colleagues mentioned, we need to think about the food sovereignty in the new ways of thinking and based on sovereignty of uh, the nations. And uh, in terms of innovation, of course, there are, as uh, Ali mentioned, there are lots of potential in the region. In terms of water harvesting, in terms of uh, plant diversity, and a new technology. And the new technology can be divided in two parts. One, uh, digital technology, which uh, I'm actually working on that in China for the last 10 years. And I can see that a huge amount of change is happening <coughs> in China just by digital technology among the small medium farmers for food sovereignty, food for security, in terms of enhancement of the production by the communication, by new technology, by uh, access to the knowledge, access to the techniques, seeds, money, sources, and so on and so forth. And of course, biotechnology, which uh, is a wide range of options, and the new farming system. In our region, we cannot just rely on new just uh, water system and drip irrigation and so on. We need to shift to the shelter agriculture. Our main problem is not just irrigation, it's evaporation. Mm -hmm. And the uh, amount of evaporation because of the global warming is going so, so high in the very near future. That's why we need to shift to the shelter agriculture, protected agriculture, not only glass house, not only warm house, but also cool house. The whole wide range of options that we can produce uh, plants under the uh, sheltered and protected sort of environment, which uh, reduce the amount of evaporation, aspiration, the sort of uh, any kind of uh, danger that will, and the uh, sort of uh, old uh, problem that may cause the plants. That's why I think if we use new innovation with a wide range of technologies and plant production and uh, all type of uh, new techniques, with the cooperation among the member countries, particularly with the neighboring countries, mm -hmm. regional countries, and through the third party countries. There is an option that now China is working with Arab countries and Iran for uh, actually bringing down the water consumption and the drought and all these things. That's why I think this type of cooperation with the third parties, India, China, and so on and so forth, not only the regional countries, mm -hmm. that would be a good way of cooperation and innovation in cooperation, and cooperation on technology and innovation, Excellent. and I think this is a very uh, promising sort of outlook for the future, for cooperation among the countries and coping with the situation. Perfect. Um, uh, Zara, could I just, uh, if, yeah, sure. if you're trying to remember the importance of agriculture and water consumption or help your friends remember, like one kilo of grain more or less takes a thousand liters of water, and if you're going to produce fed excuse me, animal products, say five times more of the feed conversion. So it's fairly easy to remember. And if we think about how much of your, what do you drink every day? Maybe one liter of water, how much are you consuming directly through, through wheat or rice? You know, maybe a thousand times as much. Sure. So what about like a kilo of beef? Five, <laughs> five to 10,000 liters of water. Wow, there you go. Um, thank you so much. and. I'm getting quite more questions now. Sorry, I'm trying to stay on top of them. Although there's so many things I could, I'm so interested about everything you got all said, I could have asked more. Um, Logan, there's one for you that's come from the audience, which is 
I think it's referring to Qatar specifically, but it just says, how can the nation adapt its food portfolio to ensure resilience against external political and economic shifts? So obviously, given we had the blockade and other things, it's probably more forward-looking, how to avoid those. Sure. Well, the food security strategy I mentioned goes until this year, and uh, the ministry is busy uh, looking forward to figure out what's, what's next. We're dealing not only with you know, questions of where we source our feed for animal, but looking at questions of water inputs. Uh, as we heard in earlier sessions, there's different you know, sources of water here, and there's strong regulations on where those sources uh, can be used and where they can't be used and so on. So some of this is strategizing on what, what's realistic for production. There's been a lot of it. If you're here, maybe you've attended some of these events, there's been looking at innovations for vertical farming. Is that viable? Can we, which, which commodities should we do it for? Animal feed, should we do it for fruits and vegetables? Uh, is it cost competitive with alternatives on the market? And this goes back to the sovereignty question. And this really is a political question. To which, which products do we as the state of Qatar want to deem critical and essential goods that we're, we're going to subsidize and ensure that they're provided and uh, produced here and others that we're going to rely on the market. And if that market is disrupted, then we're okay with it being disrupted and we have other uh, sources, either through the strategic reserve that I mentioned or domestic uh, production. Okay. I'm not sure if that answers no, the person great. exactly. but. Ali wants to contribute yeah, to that. Uh, uh, just to build on this, what, you know, I think science and innovations can offer a lot uh, to the countries in the region and most, you know, much more broadly in, in dealing with the issue of water scarcity because this is really the discussion and how it's affecting. So in the CGIR, we've been, for example, you know, uh, plastic houses that are very popular in this region, mm -hmm. the challenge is the cooling not really the water that you use to produce the crop, but the, the cooling. It takes about eight times more water to cool down. So we've developed technologies that uses net houses and cooling at the root zone of the plants without actually having to cool the environment. So you're saving 80% of the water and you're actually multiplying by four or five the ability for any country in the region to produce food with a fraction of the water. And you're able to do the cooling using uh, small uh, solar panels to cool the water so you don't really need to consume energy. And we're bringing through collaboration with MIT uh, from the US what we call ultra low pressure emitters that uses only 10% of the energy. So you have saving on energy, you have saving on the water, and you're increasing their capacity, your capacity to produce far more crop with a drop of water. In India, for example, to grow lentil, which is a, a very strategic crop. You know, India, if you don't eat lentil, you have not eaten <clears throat> 1.3 billion people. So lentil takes usually 90 days, and you need at least one irrigation. It's very drought tolerant. So we've actually managed to reduce the growing period from 90 to 60. And then this enabled that you introduce lentil in between two rice crops that have 80 days in between using residual moisture, because this is where you need to be able to grow rice, so no added water, and you have a very important strategic crop that improves the nutrition and allow you to deal with the challenge of water scarcity. And again, maybe the final point is the question about the choices of what we eat. You can eat, you can make every every day decision we make about what we eat affects on how much water we consume. And of course, there is a time lag because this is eventually would affect the market and create demand on whether plant-based on animal-based meal. And, you know, very eloquently you mentioned, it takes about seven to eight times more water if you did, of your choices are always animal-based mm -hmm. or meat-based, uh, you know, diets compared to uh, a plant-based diet. So all of these things will need to come in the education system, in raising awareness, in preparing the children, because you're going to achieve this change over time. You cannot just do it overnight. So, I, you know, I, I am sure in, in many of the new curriculums that are being designed, right. some of these elements are taken, uh, you know, into the design of these, uh, into the design of these programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that addresses a question we also just received from the audience, which is specifically on how can we try to change diets and ex by discussing the impact on water resources. Does anybody else want to address that? 
Otherwise, I have a question asking about the Grand Renaissance Dam. I don't know, Ali, if there's something you want to talk about or whether it's something that Mark, I think I want to ask you to address it, Mark, talking about food security in Egypt, Qatar and the dam. That's the question. Would you like to take that on? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, you asked a question earlier about zero sum. And I think one of the issues on this dam is, I'm sure most of you are probably aware, but Ethiopia is in the final stages of operationalizing a very large dam on the Nile that Egypt has uh, not been particularly happy about. If you look at this dam as Ethiopia building it to take water so that it can grow crops that, and that water otherwise would have gone to Egypt, mm -hmm. then you're talking about it as a zero-sum competition. If you talk about this dam or any other water infrastructure project as something that's, gener that's creating benefits from water. So it's, there's some for irrigation, there's some for power. And then you talked about dividing those benefits that are greater than the water itself. Then you can switch from thinking about zero sum, it's my water, it's your water, to how can we manage the whole resource well and share the benefits that are greater because we're thinking about it together. Now, whether in a specific circumstance where that goes is one question, but I just would say it is, uh, you know, the way to get out of the zero sum thinking is to think, if you don't want wa you don't put water in a box and keep it in your house, you use it for something. So it's to produce some kind of benefit, an environmental benefit, a food benefit, a health benefit. So if you switch, as soon as you go from the benefit from its water, either mine or yours, to how can we produce something of value, or how do we how do we value it in the broadest sense? You can switch from the zero sum to the to positive sum. Perfect. Well, okay, <laughs> please. Yeah. <laughs> it, it would have, if it was easy uh, to answer this question in a, in a two-minute intervention in a panel, probably there would have not been an issue in the first place. True. But uh, on a more serious note, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, in my previous life as a Vice President of the African Development Bank, we've, wor we've worked on what we called a confidence building among the 12 riparian countries to try and get the countries to talk, to identify win-win opportunities to develop uh, water infrastructure along the Nile and find a, a good way to work together because every country has the right uh, to develop its own resources and to look after its own people. The question is, sometimes you get bugged in the, in the details. So there are important opportunities. For example, the question of uh, virtual water. Uh, you know, Ethiopia has almost uh, more than 200 million heads of uh, cattle. And, you know, of course, these to sustain themselves, they eat grass, they eat uh, trees, they eat shrubs. And that by itself is a consumption of water. So how can you actually use that for inter-regional trade and you're actually able to quantify some of those things and then share you know, those, uh, you know, these, these products and be able to quantify how much water is, is being shared? Uh, you know, the question about uh, 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 you know, managing the, uh, the uh, tripartite agreement between the riparian countries is a very complicated uh, diplomatic issue. And I think the countries themselves would probably be better place to, to answer. Nice. I can only offer some suggestions <laughs> on the whole question. Uh, but, you know, it's a reality. It's there. So the challenge, you know, if I was thinking about it, I would see how you would work with the existing systems in ways that brings in benefit for everyone. Nice. Uh, you know, because the water is still needed. On a, a broader comment, when you look at the River Nile as a whole, there's probably 20 to 30 times more water that goes into waste in the form of evapotranspiration in the Great Lakes itself. So instead of being focused on a small portion, no matter how big it is, it is still a very small portion of the total amount of water that goes into waste. But if you do that, then you have the complexity of security, uncharted territories in many of the open forests and, and shallow waters in Africa, and this is requiring something, at, uh, an international effort, much bigger than the riparian countries themselves. They need some of the superpowers, they need maybe institutions like the UN and others to come and start and mobilize a political process backed up by a technical process, some of the big countries, and then eventually you're able to look at opportunities for the betterment of the entire continent, not just the three countries that are concerned. Thank you. 
Very well said. Logan, I feel we're talking about Ethiopia. You're dying to pitch in. I can't not ask you to. Quickly, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we have like one minute, two minutes. Jim. I'm resisting. <laughs> <laughs> I think if anyone's Googled me, I've been working in Ethiopia for two decades. So uh, there's lots to say on this story. Maybe whoever asked this question, if you want to know more, we can meet later. Otherwise, this may be a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mati, did you have... I just uh, actually point out one of the questions which was mentioned about the consumption pattern. I think the international level and global level, the food waste and loss, the water waste and loss actually mm -hmm. is a very important issue, particularly in the rapid rate of urbanization. When the rapid rate of urbanization happens, we lost the villagers, which uh, their consumption is low, the production is high, and we transfer them to the urban area with a high consumption, low production. And this is a real big problem, particularly in food waste and loss, which we have about 33% of the total food produced is a loss or waste. And these are much more cultural governance and managemental issues in terms of to be technical. And I think this is one of the major issues that we really need to think in the same side that we are looking for, for water harvesting, food production, availability. We need to think about the food waste and loss and reducing that, which is not a hard, big job. That's why I'm thinking this is a really important thing, particularly in such a country with a long history that appreciate the food, appreciate the mercy of God, appreciate the water mm -hmm. and so on. That's another major point in the region and in the Muslim countries and in the area which I think would be, need to be considered. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's a great note to end on. We clearly recognize that the nexus between water and food is beyond, um, is beyond mere, mere resources. It's got social, political, governance, ramification. We, we could talk about these issues all day, but we are standing between you and your food. And I don't think a food panel should be doing that. So please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers.